grateful to the Goodrich and to Joanne Pariso and uh, Sarah Rosaccio, who created the poster. I don't know if you saw it, but it's very bright and colorful and informative. And uh, so I was very touched by that. And, and thank you to uh, Kelby Rodriguez for doing the filming <laughs> for NEKTV and for, you know, helping troubleshoot some things that came up before <laughs> we started. So it's wonderful that you're here, neighbors and friends and new friends. And so thank you. Um, uh, so I, I've been asked to speak for Women's History Month, um, as I've done for most years since 1977, when I was the official photographer at the First National Women's Conference. And um, so a couple of years ago, I created a website for this conference. There, are, there is a whole other area. Uh, on my dianamarahenry.com website that um, is women on the move. If you look at the very busy <laughs> home page for dianamarahenry.com, you'll see a women on the move link. And then you can click on that, and that was created for the 35th anniversary of the conference. But then um, a couple of years ago for the uh, 45th anniversary, I created this website, which is spiritofhouston.net. And uh, I was uh, generously gifted with a grant from the Vermont Council on the Arts, so I'm very grateful to them for, you know, giving me the support to create this website. And uh, <clears throat> there's um, the same, right the year before, in 21, um, I got the support of the Ms. Foundation for Women to uh, reissue the original official report of the Spirit of Houston about the conference. And it hadn't been reissued since 1978 because uh, 85 of my photographs are in it and they're copyrighted. So after trying to get numerous <laughs> academics in the field of the women's movement or feminist studies to reprint it, um, I decided to do it myself. <laughs> and so the Ms. Foundation for Women helped me to do that with a grant, and Gloria Steinem uh, gave me permission to reprint an essay of hers that hadn't been reprinted since 1978 either. So it's a, it's a brilliant essay about the conference, and it's, it's in, uh, in this new edition, in addition to a few extra pages. So um, I brought a few copies of that tonight, and of my book, Women on the Move, which is also in the collection of the Goodrich, so you can, you can look at it that way. So uh, what I did was I, um, I cre oh, here on this website, you'll see there's a, I don't know if you can see the little cursor, but there's a gallery section in this website. So if you want to look at any of the pictures again, or there's a lot of guest posts in it about, you know, their, how they participated in the conference or how their mother participated in the conference. Liz Carpenter's daughter um, created some, some content. So, you know, it might be something to look at later on. So now, let me see if I can get the PowerPoint, which I created for our meeting. And um, I, I thought maybe I'd start with a, a little video, with your permission. It's, uh, it's about 12 minutes. Uh, but it, what it does is it's a recap of the 35th anniversary celebration, which was in 2012 and occurred in New York City at the borough president's office. So you'll see first the borough president speaking. He's a nephew of Bella Abzug, as it turns out, who sort of has a starring role in the story, both mine and the conferences. So it starts out with that and then some of the other speakers. So, um, and it was created by UMass, which was very nice. 
Nationally recognized photographer Diana Mara Henry was only in her mid-twenties when she was appointed the official photographer for both the National Commission on the Observance of International Women's Year and the first National Women's Conference in 1977. Henry's collection, housed in the W.E.B. Du Bois Library at the UMass Amherst, is a rich archive of four decades of political, social, and cultural change in America, beginning in the late 1960s, as seen through the lens of one photojournalist. Her body of work ranges from coverage of the New York fashion scene in the 1970s to photo essays on one-room schoolhouses in Vermont and everyday life in Brooklyn, France, Nepal, and Bali. It is particularly rich in documenting the women's movement, second wave feminism, and the political scene of the 1970s. Henry's Women on the Move exhibit serves as a remarkable record of women in politics, housing dozens of images of Bella Abzug, Shirley Chisholm, Liz Carpenter, Betty Friedan, Jane Fonda, Elizabeth Holtzman, and Gloria Steinem. In 2012, an exhibit was held in New York City on the 30th anniversary of the first National Women's Conference to celebrate Diana Mara Henry's exhibit, Women on the Move. Now, this display of photographs from the National Women's Conference and the New York State Women's Meeting of 1977 is truly amazing, and everyone should take some time tonight and really look at those photos. It's an extraordinary achievement, a testament to the dedication of these brave women to change the social and political landscape of our country. They carry the torch of a new generation moving women's issues to the forefront of our nation's consciousness where they stayed now for 35 years. Gloria Steinem, a critical member of the women's movement who is featured in numerous photographs by Diana Mar Henry, spoke at the event. Listening to Diana, you can see the inclusive, careful, thoughtful, humane, humorous spirit that is behind the camera that makes the photographs as universal as they are, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, a different person would have produced a much more limited record. Uh, I have found so often in the years since then that this was an event uh, that makes me measure my life before it and after it. I mean, I really, as much as I thought in my head that I believed that women could together pull off a huge, national, complicated, protested, uh, you know, resented by Congress that financed it <laughs> <laughs> effort, I, I, I'm not sure that I really believed it. And it was only afterwards that I had that kind of confidence. And it was this event that did it. And actually, for the female half of the population, and in general, in terms of being representative by economics and culture and ethnicity and race and experience and so on, it is the most democratic movement or meeting and series of meetings. I mean, just in New York State alone, there were 20,000 people, 20,000 people, electing delegates and, and mm. selecting issues. It, that this nation has ever seen, you know what I mean? So it's so wonderful to be in a room full of memories that makes it real all over again, uh, and to understand deeply that it was a beginning. Congresswoman Elizabeth Holtzman also spoke at the event, reflecting on the movement and expressing her gratitude for Diana's photographs. Thank you, Diana, for sharing these wonderful photos with us. You may see in her book a photo that she took of me on the Brooklyn Bridge, which was my campaign photo in 1972. Oh, helped to elect me. It shows what a great photographer she is. And it's great to be reminded of the history. Gloria reminds us it was filled with such energy, and it reflected the views of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of women around the country. It was fabulous. And so, the amazing thing is that this story, our story, didn't start with this um, conference. It actually didn't even start with the Seneca Falls Conference. Women have been fighting for a very long time to be counted just as human beings. And the only thing we can do is move that process along 
a wee bit faster. And we're going to do that. And that conference was a way of showing that women had an agenda, and it wasn't an agenda just for themselves, it was an agenda for families, for the country, for the world. It was a way of showing everyone's innate dignity and humanity. And that's a lesson you know, that still hasn't been learned, but we're going to make sure, at least in the United States, that that, not as Martin Luther King said, how much longer? Not much longer. <laughs> that's the message. Thank you, Diane. One of the most touching moments of the event for Diana was the reunion of the three torchbearers, whom she had photographed in the Women on the Move First National Women's Conference March from Houston. Most exceptionally, I want to thank Peggy Cochranock Kaplan, the woman who represented the First National Women's Conference on the cover of Time magazine in 1977. And her amazingly successful efforts to find the other two women the magazine should have put on the cover <laughs> since they carry the torch also That's for the true. last triumphant mile of the 2600 miles from Seneca Falls to Houston. Michelle Searcy and yeah. Sylvia Bertini. The editorial prejudice which existed then still exists today in the coverage of other stories and I beg you to be aware as you view the photographs you're provided with of all the beautiful humanity that's left on the cutting room floor and the slaughter that comes from these malicious decisions. In any case, thanks to Peggy, we're now six new friends bonded together by these photographs that made the mark on their lives I'll tell you about. I could have made all my remarks about this amazing reunion with the torchbearers, but I want to leave time for the stories that you all have to tell. Um, as luck would have it, I found myself uh, running the torch relay first in Alabama, the 16-mile stretch that Phyllis Schlafly was able to get that uh, boycotted by other runners. And then, of course, the last mile with all the dignitaries, but especially uh, Michelle and, and Sylvia. And it opened my eyes to the injustices that many women face, but it also uh, showed me the enormous power that women have when they come together uh, as a movement. All right, I, I will tell you I'm an educator of 36 years. I teach and I coach volleyball, and I probably wouldn't be here if it weren't uh, for the movement back then. At the time, I was only six year, 16 years of age, a baby. <laughs> um, I enjoy the event. Uh, my mom gave me the uh, go ahead to participate in the event. It was very exciting, it was challenging, it was a learning experience for me. A few of the many other influential women who spoke at the event included Carmen Delgado and Melba Tolliver. 1977 was historic. It was fun. <laughs> it was a challenge. It taught our nation that women meant business. It wasn't fame and fortune that mattered there. It was commitment. It was commitment to some ideas that were ripe at the moment. Uh, I, I want to say, Diana, that I'm really here because of you. Uh, because you have been so passionate about these photographs, about documenting this uh, unique event. And um, I just uh, had a chance to be touched by your passion and I, I just wanted to be here to support you to see the pictures mounted and to thank you to thank you for holding this precious gift for so long so patiently amy simon of she's history entertained the conference with her performance as bella abzug do you know me yeah. Well, good, because American Express did not know me. <laughs> and when I was in the Congress of the United States, and I applied for an American Express card, they told me I had to get my husband to sign for it. <laughs> so I called my husband. I said, Martin, American Express says you have to sign for my card. He said, Bella, I love you. I wouldn't trade you, even for Joe Namath. <laughs> but you're going to have to tell American Express to give you your own card. So, in the Congress of the United States, we passed the credit law in which we were able to get women to get their own credits. 
<laughs> and I wasn't sure I wanted to get an American Express card, <laughs> but I decided to so I could tell this story. <laughs> and that is what Bella Abzug really said in a fake American Express commercial. <laughs> she made it in 1983 for a women's conference at Rutgers University. She wanted to make a point. Bella was 50 years old when she first got into Congress. There were 435 members of Congress. Nine of them were women. She was one of them. First day on the job, she tries to get the troops out of Vietnam. The first member of Congress to ask for Nixon's impeachment. <laughs> One of the first members of Congress to ask for gay rights. She was the first on everything important, they said. She was a great, great pain in the ass. <laughs> Give him hell, Bella. That is what I heard growing up here in New York with Bella. Thank you for letting me do Bella Absolutely. Politically, I hope to see a stamp series honoring women leaders of the 1970s, as depicted in my photographs of Shirley, Bella, Liz Cole, Carpenter, Betty Friedan, and Coretta. Uh, the Anna Mari Henry 20th Century Photographer Collection that now resides at the Google Library. Uh, I hope you like that video. I think it's a, it's a really nice uh, statement and. Um, you know, these people, I, I feel so blessed that I know them, that, you know, they reached out to me or through other ways. I've gotten to meet them again, and, um, yeah, so I think it, let me go on now. Um, okay, so let me see, am I here? Oh, okay. So uh, Joanne thought that I should say a little bit about how I came to do this. <laughs> Not sure myself, but... Uh, you know, you look back and you say, well, you know, my mother was a designer, that's her on the left, and, you know, my father was very interested in advertising and had been really involved in social movements since, you know, his earliest years. Uh, you know, at Harvard, he went down to the piers to protest uh, Hitler sending a warship to the Boston docks in 1934. When he came back to his dorm room, the Communist Party was there to recruit him. <laughs> he became a card member, card-carrying communist for you know eight years until he met my mother, who, you know, had grown up on the Lower East Side and uh, you know worked in a factory since she was twelve, and <laughs> she looked at his books of Marx and Lenin and you know said, "You don't believe that stuff, do you, Carl?" So. <laughs> He up and quit the Communist Party. But anyway, I, I went to a girl's school starting out in Cincinnati. That's me sort of in the middle all by myself, in the middle rung, and my best friend Cynthia Kuhn is above me. Um, so I'm still in touch with Cynthia. So fast forward to college. So I was looking for a connection there, and... There wasn't much at a big university, so I, uh, I went to the Harvard Crimson, which was the newspaper, and uh, learned photography. So I tell people Harvard was my trade school. <laughs> Pretty nearly dropped out from, you know, not that I would have wanted to, but, uh, you know, I missed an exam, and I, <laughs> I failed to course in French culture and civilization and the dean had to reach out and you know ask the uh, the professor if he'd give me a D instead of an E so I could graduate so you know it was well, it was it was fun but it was photography really is what kept me so I think some people may remember the 60s here but in any case this is what it looked like, and I, I sort of picked a variety of images that show, you know, different aspects, which I now realize are about fashion and about maybe gender roles, and, uh, you know, maybe my mother, you know, had something to do with, you know, my eye for this kind of thing, and also I was watching the, you know, the civilization, clash of civilizations. Um, 
I call this one my first feminist photograph. I was doing a slideshow for Schweik in the second, was it Schweik in the Second World War? Um, a play, and uh, I was asked to create a slideshow for it. And I went down to Boston's North End, and I don't know if you can see it. Does anyone remember this poster? So this was a poster of a woman cut up into uh, pieces, like a side of beef. It, it's hard to see, but, but there are lines scoring her body. Do you remember that? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's like, uh, so, you know, I sometimes think the power of photography uh, is also a real world uh, power between the photographer and the person being photographed. And I like to imagine that with this, with this butcher, you know, looking at the same thing I'm looking at, but with me photographing it, that maybe he took down the poster. So, because I, I think the act of photography has that power, even in a sort of limited space between the, the, the people who are involved. So anyway, more scenes of New York City, fashion models in 67, 68, and going on to 71, which I call my wild and crazy year at the Renaissance Fair, one of the first ones. Oh, and some of these I actually, um, I actually have some postcards there. If you want to take some postcards and make a donation to the Goodrich or something, you're welcome to grab some. But, um, so, you know, I was looking at men and women, and then 71, I also got very, you know, involved in the issue of the Vietnam War, and this was the incursion into Cambodia. And... <laughs> which uh, was being protested on Park Avenue. Allard Lowenstein, a great photographer who was assassinated, and his wife, Jennifer. Liz Holtzman, you saw the picture already, and, <laughs> and Bella Abzug. Um, the two guiding lights. I really started photography in 72, seriously. Uh, as a professional with the assignment for Liz Holtzman. I don't think she really knew that that was my first <laughs> paid assignment. But And then I heard Bella Abzug speak. I was listening to Pacifica Radio, WBAI. And I was, I always listened to Pacifica in the dark room and I heard this booming voice. And I thought, I've never heard a woman speak like that. You know, um, I, I've got to see this woman. So I went down the next day to her press conference. And I took this picture, and I was so excited. I was changing my lens. I didn't use a zoom lens. I didn't like a zoom lens. So I was changing my lens. I had sort of squirreled in between all the male <laughs> newscasters' feet. And I was so excited looking up at her about this photograph. I kind of knew it was going to be great. And I dropped my cam, dropped my lens. So anyway, it worked out. She used it as a poster. I brought it to her office, and they used it as a big poster. And then she hired me for just about all of her subsequent campaigns. I saw her that year also at the uh, Democratic National Convention in Miami Beach. Uh, where I got in without uh, a pass. So that's a, another story that I can tell you about. But uh, this was the New York delegation with Betty Friedan on the left, Liz Holtzman, Addie Wyatt, who's a, a great uh, churchwoman, and also a, a, uh, uh, a union leader. Uh, the Meatpackers Union was her union. And... Um, Herman Badillo at, at sitting down in front of them, who was a congressman. Uh, so through the magic of the internet, I now know who some of the people were that I photographed at this convention. So for instance, I know that this is Margaret Opie, and I've connected with both her son and her daughter. Um, she was a welfare rights delegate. Her son teaches at Harvard and Babson. Her daughter teaches at Babson. College, so you know, life has 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 moved on and gotten you know 
expanded and changed for from generation to generation as it did for me and you know so more delegates and people greeting Shirley Chisholm uh, who I actually have a better photograph of her with her eyes open but I kind of think this is cute too <laughs> so um, and this is my favorite photograph of her and one of my favorite photographs ever <laughs> Uh, of her at the convention. She was running for president. Uh, but I had been working, I had been volunteering for the McGovern campaign since uh, the primaries in, in New Hampshire. I told someone I was interested in McGovern and, you know, I'd love to photograph him. And they said to me, I don't know who it was, but they said to me, why don't you get on the press bus? And I'm like, can I do that? And they said, yeah, just call his campaign and say you want to get on the press bus. And, of course, they asked me if I had an assignment. I said, no, I'm there. on, You know, I'd be on spec, which means, you know, I'll try to get my assignment later. But, uh, actually, the, the photographs were published for the McGovern campaign in, you know, nationally on T-shirts and, you know, in leaflets like this one for, for the women's section. And there again, I went to rallies, and this woman who's holding the sign, this whole group was standing on top of a car. <laughs> and, you know, I thought, well, I'll never know who these people are. And then the, this woman, Sally Popkin's daughter, wrote me, Annie Popkin, and said, I, I understand you have a photograph of my mother. So, you know, this was like 30 years or more after the event. So now I know who this woman is, and it's, it's, to me, that's really exciting and wonderful to, you know, to make that connection. I, a little phrase has been floating through my mind recently, which is with the change in AI and all of the, you know, sort of manufactured images that we're seeing today, you know, I think what's precious about these images is that they're real people. <laughs> the, these were real people. So uh, I don't know if that's, you know. Anyway, I thought I'd put in just one or two other events that I photographed. Uh, this was a demonstration for the use of the term Ms. at the New York Times. Uh, the term Ms. had already come into the dictionary in 1974. And, um, the New York Times uh, was not using it. Ms. Magazine had come into existence. Do you know, all know what the term Ms. sort of stands for? Why in the 60s and 70s we wanted the term Ms. to? It's on all the forms now. And it's really interesting when I, when I speak to groups, and even when I was doing... Um, I was doing my uh, substitute teaching, and I would write my name on the board. I'd put down Ms. Henry, you know, and then it would be like, do you know what the term Ms. means? It was like, no. So, um, so the term Ms. Uh, was meant to substitute Miss or Mrs. So that when a woman was introduced before the term Ms. came into use, the first thing you heard, even before her name, was whether she was married or not. So imagine that with a man. <laughs> Doesn't exist, right? Mister is mister. He will tell you if he's married or not. It's not part of the professional role that people play. But women, you know, were still introduced according to their marital status. So it was a great advance, which no one really is aware of anymore. It's, you know, become part of the culture. But in a sense, it's been lost to the culture, too. But anyway, so here, uh, oh, I was going to ask you, when do you think the New York Times started to use the term Ms.? Right? So my friend Jan Le Levy sent this to me in 1986 when they started to use the term Ms., so 12 years later. Uh, Gloria Steinem used this, you know, it, event as I photographed it on her website because, of course, Ms. Magazine. And then there were demonstrations for the ERA in New York City and, 
1976, and this photograph uh, is on a panel. I don't know if you can see it all the way at the right. There's a big panel. I haven't seen it, but it's at the uh, Legacies of the Civil War exhibit at Historic Tredegar, Virginia. So I think that's quite nice. Uh, a woman's place is in the White House. Well, we're getting there, I guess. <laughs> All right. First National Women's Conference. So Bella Abza, you know, reached out to me through uh, her assistants, Lee, Lee Novick and Mim Kelber, and asked me to be the photographer. I'd also already photographed the, the New York State Women's Meeting. The National Women's Conference was funded by $5 million grant from Congress. And the $5 million also covered state meetings in all 50 states and the US territories, like American Samoa, the Virgin Islands, you know, Washington, DC. So it was, um, it was a, a major effort, as Gloria <laughs> mentioned. And I was the official photographer. There was an official photographer for the torch relay from Seneca Falls to Houston which sort of brought awareness across the country, at least north to south. And then um, I photographed the inside of the conference. So while other photographers, like in a national convention, would have to get a press pass, go onto the floor of the conference, and then after 20 minutes come back and give the press pass back so someone else could rotate in, I could be there all the time. So it was a... It was a great responsibility. Uh, started before the conference when we were assembling uh, for the last mile of the march with the with the torch into the convention center in uh, Houston. And uh, this is Maya Angelou on the right who uh, created the statement for the conference, which is in the book. And. Um, Betty Friedan, the women's magazine publishers were there, of course, Good Housekeeping, Red Book. This is my most published photograph. So I think you can see Billie Jean King on the, on the left. And then Susan B. Anthony, who's the great grandniece of the uh, suffragist Susan B. Anthony, Bella Abzug, and um, uh, Sylvia, Sylvia Ortiz, Peggy Cockernot, Michelle Searcy, and Betty Friedan. And this photograph is used a lot in textbooks. And when I license it, I always say you have to use everyone's name, <laughs> not just the celebrities, because, and it's only happened once in one feminist textbook where they said, you know, three Houston ass athletes carrying the torch. And I'm like, you know, they have names too. So, so it's always, and I think the torchbearers are aware of that, and they're, you know, they, they know that I've recognized them through the years, through my photograph. So now the torch is inside the conference. The three first ladies were there. Uh, so Lady Bird Johnson, uh, uh, Rosalind Carter, who's waving, and Betty Ford in the background. And um, so uh, they also held up the torch in a show of unity, bipartisan unity, since uh, you know Betty Ford is a Republican woman. And it was under her husband, Gerald Ford, that actually the Commission on the Observance of International Women's Year, which was the guiding body of this conference, was signed into existence. Um, so Gloria Scott uh, raised the gavel that had been used at the uh, 1848 conference at Seneca Falls, the, the Women's Suffrage Conference. And um, so she opened the conference with that gavel. I think Bella used a different gavel afterwards because she probably would have broken it. But <laughs> this is a picture of Bella at the New York State meeting, actually, not at the conference. Um, Betty, uh, Betty Ford and Coretta Scott King applauding Barbara Jordan, Congresswoman from Texas, her keynote address. 
uh, at, outside the conference waiting to go, get, go in. Alcoholism is a woman's issue on this delegate's T-shirt. Uh, so Mim Kelber, who, who was the editor for the, um, the official report, told me to, you, to get everyone's names that I photographed. And I really didn't like doing that. I had never really done that before. It kind of interrupts the flow, you know, of the, the visual excitement that you're involved in. And then you have to pull out a pad and write down a name and, you know, who, what they look like. And anyway, it was tedious, and I'm so glad I did it. And I'm so glad she asked me to do it. So anyway, uh, this is a 17-year-old delegate and her chaperone, her mother told her she could go to the conference if she would, you know, stick by Alice Bebo, so who is another delegate from California. And of course, as Gloria said, there was a very wide variety of women representing different territories and states, American Samoa. Uh, Patsy Mink, who was the first Asian American woman in Congress, spoke. And Barbara Jordan gave the keynote address. And this is the throng getting her, getting the program signed after the address. From, the, from midway back through the conference hall, this is what the conference hall looked like. Um, you know, I, I just wonder if there could be a conference like this today with a big sign, woman. And who would be at this conference? I, I'm, just, I'm just asking the question. I ask it of younger, younger people when we talk, because I don't know what they're thinking now about women. <laughs> but in those days, it was something we identified with. And of course, this conference was you know, by women, for women, about women. So just. Who knew that was going to be as controversial again as it is now? So there were great differences of style and you know individual expression. Uh, this is Dolores Tucker, who was the first Secretary of State of any state in Pennsylvania, and Liz Holtzman, you saw already, Ernest Delegate with the Roberts Rules of Order. So as part of being the official photographer, I think Bella contacted me or someone on her behalf and said, you know, come up to the hotel room tonight. We're having a meeting of the commissioners. So this was like a planning meeting of the commissioners. Uh, it was, you know, very late at night and, you know, very, um, you know, very honor, well, great honor to be there. This woman here... Uh, is Lee Novick, who you'll see in a bit, but she um, she is the woman who put together this conference. So when you think that she organized and you know structured the conference so there could be a national convention, wow, doesn't get enough credit ever, I don't think. This was another behind the scenes tour of the conference center before the conference, you know, so the commissioners could see. Uh, you know, what the building was and where everything, you know, would be happening behind the scenes as well as on stage. Um, this photograph, you know, I asked Gloria which photograph I should use of her for to illustrate the essay. And she wanted this one. So, you know, I'm happy she likes it because I like it too. You know, everyone wanted to look like Gloria with the you know, long straight hair and the aviator glasses. And so here she's speaking. You know, you can see her on the monitor and someone else is watching her. And here again is the style that, <laughs> you know, really was it, was, it was a very popular style to model yourself after Gloria. So Jean Stapleton, for you know all in the family, right? <laughs> yeah, so Edith Bunker. Um, you know, had a great interest in this conference, and she also was at the New York State Women's Meeting promoting it, which I'll show you in a minute. So at the, at the time, there were two women who were uh, heads of the Republican National Committee and the Democrat National Committee. 
So Gene Westwood was uh, chair of the Democratic National Committee, and uh, Mary Crisp was co-chair of the Republican National Committee. And you saw this image of Peggy and Jill Ruckel's house. Uh, so there were some very prominent Republican women at the conference. Jill Ruckel's house was one of them. You see her here in the middle also. And Margaret Heckler, who was a Republican congresswoman from uh, Massachusetts on the left, and a parliamentarian, I don't know her name, on the right. There were uh, leaders from the National Organization for Women. So this one is Karen DeCrow with the sunglasses. And uh, two other women who were very involved with now, Corinne Horball and Eleanor Smeal. More delegates and style. The, the whistle uh, is, uh, the, the woman holding it is a, is a lawyer, and it's, the whistle is her uh, business card. So she had her name and contact information on the whistle, and it was a rape whistle. So <laughs> the majority delegates wore majority um, ribbon because they were representing that they were opposed to many of the planks in the National Plan of Action, but they were actually the majority of American women. So, um, so they didn't boycott the conference, but they, you know, they made their position known by wearing this this ribbon, uh, a, you know, anti-abortion, anti-lesbian, -les whatever rights. You know, there was a variety of issues that they opposed. And what's really interesting about this uh, document, the official report, is that not only are the pl is the plan of action, you know, explained and and reproduced but also the minority opinions. So on every plan of action plank, there's a minority opinion so that you can read you know, the, the differences in um, position of the different you know, viewpoints that were there. I don't know if that would happen today. <laughs> uh, so here's an, uh, some more variety of opinion. This woman is holding up a sign saying, keep them in the, in the, in the closet. <laughs> and um, Betty Hamburger, her grandson, asked me for that photograph to uh, include on Hanukkah cards for all his family, or her family. Um, you know, many years later. I actually know her name now, and I, I haven't updated the caption, so it escapes me. I think she's an activist from Brooklyn. So here's Susan B. Anthony calling the question on the ERA. In other words, let's vote for it. And the majority delegates are sitting down. They're not participating in the celebration. Of course, it was, they were voice votes. So it was like, who shouts the loudest gets, you know, gets the plank passed. So, you know, it passed and there was a celebration. You saw some of the pictures of it. The majority delegates stayed seated and the others are kind of gloating, I think, at least the one in back. More of the ERA celebration. Uh, the, the bras read, we didn't burn them. So whether the bras were actually burned or not, in a, I think you, you might remember that in, at the Miss America, I think it was the Miss America con uh, contest, that there were some demonstrations against the objectification of women's bodies and the, the use of the bra as a, as a vehicle for whatever. Anyway, women's liberation also sometimes included this liberation from bras. The celebration for the welfare rights plank. This has also been used on the cover of a book. Uh, I, I took a minute to go to Phyllis Schlafly's conference. She, was, she had organized a sort of a counter-conference the same weekend. And uh, so I thought my coverage should include at least a photograph of her. So this is her speaking at a press conference. I later got to talk to her, you know, many years later. And she said, did you photograph our conference? 
because I think she wanted some photographs, you know, more than of just her. And I said, no, I said, Bella hired me, you know, so I was working for Bella. But she's a very nice lady, she's very, very nice. Uh, so here's the convention hall with uh, displays like this NASA display. It was really a recruiting booth. And you could picture yourself as an astronaut. And uh, I, I remember feeling, being totally incredulous of this. Like, I can't believe women are going to be astronauts, you know. And of course it happened, not that many years later, but... You know, uh, oral history and progress. Women from Houston also volunteered to work at the conference, in police force, bus drivers. The end of the conference with a celebration and the signer for the deaf, is it right? It's kind of sweet. She's, her job is done, but she's, you know, enjoying <laughs> what her work has been. Uh, this is a testimonial from Billie Jean King about the conference and my photographs. So after the conference, the, the report was, was published in March, so not very, you know, three months later. And Bella and the commissioners took it to the White House. And this is at the White House with President Carter standing there with the book under his arm. <laughs> looking pretty stiff because Bella's giving him what for. And he later fired her, not very many months later. And uh, Rosalind is on the left, and then she got to hold up this T-shirt, which was sort of the iconic T-shirt of the conference, which I reissued. for. Um, so... Gloria Steinem at the, at, the, um, at the White House was introduced to the baby of one of the delegates. And so in this photograph, the inset, she's holding the baby. And the baby's name is ERA. She's the daughter of Judy McCarthy, a delegate. I think a Cherokee delegate. Um, and then this is on the cover is ERA many years later with her husband. And she's also come to events that I've spoken at and so on for, and spoken herself and so on. And this is her with her mom, uh, you know, age progression. <laughs> um, I'm so grateful for the gifts the ERA movement and my name have given him, given me. Before the movement, I could never have enjoyed the position in life that I do now. Also, my name and everything it stands for has made me believe in myself regardless of the difficulties I faced in life. So, this is the organizer of the conference, Lee Novick. Uh, and she taught at Stanford at uh, political science, I think at Stanford or Berkeley. And then she became a rabbi later in life. So I knew her also later in life because we lived, to get, lived close by in Carmel. She was in Carmel Valley. I was in Carmel. Uh, the exhibit has been shown at different places. This is at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. with their poster and Joe Freeman looking at the exhibit. You heard about the stamp campaign, the torchbearers, Here's Jean Stapleton again, uh, celebrating the women's meeting. Uh, Ruby D. so there was promotion for the New York State women's meeting. And as part of it, Ruby D. and some other celebrities toured New York in a bus. And I love this picture of her, you know, under George Washington on Wall Street, signing autographs and letting people know. And then the conference itself, the New York State meeting included an evening of entertainment where Ruby Dee again entertained as well as other women including Viney Burroughs who's on the cover of my book Women on the Move who just died in her mid-90s. She had been, I mean just in the past year, she had been performing on Broadway or off Broadway right until the end. But her, uh, she didn't find many roles for black women. So she created her own shows, and she created at least five different shows that she took on the road, which were monologues 
you know, theatrical uh, presentations about women in history, especially black women. So more of the, uh, these women support the coalition slate, and then one of them's wearing a dyke sign on her, on her lapel. So here's Melba Tolliver. You saw Melba Tolliver at the, in the video, right? And she said, thank you, Diana, for holding this precious gift. We're still in touch. We were talking about doing a book uh, together called Can't Say We Didn't Try. <laughs> So I haven't heard from her, though, recently, unfortunately. I keep reaching out, but this is her filing her story. She has a very interesting um, story about her in journalism. She, she was on ABC TV in New York as an anchor woman, but she always wore her hair straightened or covered with a scarf or with a wig, so she would not have an afro. She would not have her natural hair. And she was assigned to, to uh, cover uh, Trish Nixon's wedding in, uh, I think, 1971. And at Trish Nixon's wedding, she decided to go natural with her afro. And when she came back to New York, she actually was, was laid off. Her, her boss told her that she could not appear on the uh, news as an anchor woman with her natural hair. And I remember, I was in New York then, I, I swear I remember the outcry, the outrage in New York City that she had been, you know, put on leave. And she was back within a week. And it was, a, a, to me, a great advance for human rights that she was able to appear with her natural body uh, and, and be a professional. So, reporter from the Philippines, this is what the New York State Women's Meeting looked like in the hallway, so you can see the thousands of people that were spoken about. Childcare, not so much. I don't know what happened. They didn't really think about this too. <laughs> Too much, I don't think, because this was child care at the New York State Women's Meeting, so go figure. Um, there were some great art exhibits. You know, I created one called Women Photographers of New York State, honoring 70 women photographers. This was a sports exhibit, you know, again, like the child care, a little bit of a, <laughs> little bit of a second thought, I think. A great range of topics, and this was going on all over the country you know, in every state and territory. There's serious challenge, I would think, to know who to vote for and what plank to vote for. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is the voting booth. And the end of the conference with Mitch Costanza. These are a few of the people at the conference. So I was interested in doing a survey, resurvey of the women of the conference, and I thought I'd start with the youngest delegates. So Dottie, Dottie Starr was 16 at the time, and uh, then she sent me this updated photograph of her. And this was, she filled out the survey very thoroughly with, you know, her position and how it had affected her. This was another delegate who filled out the survey, but, you know, much more sparsely. Uh, she... Actually, I was able to get in touch with her, and her boss was so excited. He said she works in the mailroom, <clears throat> but we're very excited, you know, to be honoring her for this conference. And so we're going to have a, a you know, a little get together, a little party or something for her. Uh, so, you know, I was happy about that, that that had, she was age 16 at the time in a foster home. This is the oldest delegate to the First National Women's Conference, uh, Clara Beyer, an influential New Deal administrator who served as a confidential aide to Frances Perkins uh, during Frances Perkins' 12 years as Secretary of Labor. Uh, and anyway, she was uh, a close friend of Secretary Perkins and Eleanor Roosevelt, and so on, so. Uh, just where the New York 
state women's meeting took place. And then this is my final little section, which I'll run through very quickly because you've been very patient. But I thought you'd like to see another event in women's activism that is very little known uh, in the United States, but in Europe, they're crazy about this event. So all the requests that I get for this event, you know, are from France or the European community. Um, you know, it's the Women's Pentagon action. And it was also the last time I saw Bella. She was there. Women were there in such numbers that uh, we surrounded the Pentagon, which is a huge building. It's at least a mile around. And there were enough women there to hold hands and surround the building. It was very exciting, yes. And the, the main activity was to prevent people from coming in and going out of the Pentagon so that they would think about you know, their militaristic endeavors and so on. So the, um, this actually was very successful. People were prevented from going in and out, at least slowed down. They weren't prevented. But the police presence was very benign. Uh, <laughs> you know, they helped people climb over the demonstrators to get in and out. And, uh, you know, there was you know, music and so on. So that's it. I is the end of my presentation, but I'm happy to ask, answer questions or talk to you about what matters to you about this. Thank you. Diana, um, your connection is with Harvard and... Um, not yeah. really, not anymore. <laughs> not anymore, well, yeah. like, but uh, all of this yeah. is archived in UMass. Yeah, I said UMass. Our, Harvard is, uh, it's our 55th reunion this May for our class of 1969. So I'm not sure. This may be the first reunion I'm not going to go to. I may. I'm not sure. Why UMass? UMass, so it started with my, it must have started with my 40th or my, you know, I went to every reunion that I could possibly go to. I mean, I think it's important as a, some people shun them, but I think it's a rite of passage. You know, you have to see your old friends, you have to see people getting older, you know, and also I made a lot of friends at reunions that I hadn't known in college. You know, so a lot has happened for me personally, for me professionally from the reunions. So, this reunion I met, I think it was my 40th, I met a man, um, I'm trying to remember his name now, who, um, who was at, an, he was the publisher, a publisher at UMass University Press. And so he was in my class at Harvard, so I said to him, you know, where, I'm looking for an archive for my photographs, where would you suggest? And he said, well, you could try Harvard. But he said, we have a dy dynamic new uh, director at the Du Bois Library, and you should really talk to him. And so I reached out to him, and he came and saw, at the time I was living in Springfield, Mass., he came with his curator. And they looked through my, you know, I've preserved my photographs, hundreds and thousands of photographs for, you know, years, going across country, never storing them in the basement. Uh, and, you know, he looked through my file cabinets, they were, they were always really well organized, and after about 10 minutes he said, you know, we'll take them. And then we went to a local Vietnamese restaurant for lunch. <laughs> so, that's how it happened. I think I did reach out to Harvard and they said, we'll take them, but we won't pay anything. And UMass did pay me something. So that was great. But, uh, yeah, so that's how it happened. Any other question? Yeah? How did you get such a good look on um, taking a photo of the woman who, uh, an African American who was the first woman to, to go for presidency? Sure. Sure. Yeah, she yeah. isn't? Yeah. Well, um, so how I got into the Democratic National Convention was 
I just had been photographing McGovern and I just decided, you know, I can't have photographed his campaign and not photograph the convention where I think he's going to be selected as the presidential nominee. You know, so I, I packed up my dark room, my smaller and larger, and um, I, uh, my college roommate, and, who was still my friend, I don't know, just sort of drifted apart, but she came with me to LaGuardia Airport, and there were huge lines to, to for the ticket counter for the airlines. And so we looked and we were like, well, why don't we stand there? Because there's some sort of cute young guys <laughs> at the end of that line, so you know, maybe we'll start up a conversation. So sure enough, you know, and they were going down to the con to the uh, convention to work on Dick Tuck's uh, um, reliable source newspaper. Dick Tuck was a Democratic prankster, and so he, you know, at these conventions and Nixon's banquets and so on. One of Nick Nixon's banquets, he infiltrated the the fortune cookies. It was a Chinese themed banquet because <laughs> because Nixon had opened up you know, trade with China. And so Dick Tuck uh, had stuffed all the fortune cookies with uh, Richard Nixon's dirty tricks. <laughs> so <laughs> people opened these fortune cookies at the end of the day, and I was like, oh, you know. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so these young men were going to work for Dick Tuck. They, you know, none of us were paid. So they said, well, you should be our photographer. We don't have a photographer. So I became the photographer. And the first couple of days of the convention, we didn't have press passes. So you saw, you know, I photographed the Charlotte Chisholm supporters outside, and Flamingo Park, and, you know, where the hippies were camping out. And then uh, one of our number, one of those young men, I won't say his name, <laughs> arrived, and he said, I got five press passes. I mean, he said, I was going past his desk, and there were five press passes there. And so now we all have press passes, you know? So, and in those days, there were no, you know, ID pictures. There was, you know, it was pretty casual, as you can tell, because we all got in the last night, which was the big night. Um, and I think in this brochure, maybe you see the picture of Clinton. Is Clinton yes. in this brochure? Yeah. So I photographed Clinton at the, at the convention uh, because, you know, it was the. McGovern was giving his speech, and, you know, I was able to circulate. The McGovern photographers, staff photographers, were sequestered in the back of the room. But I had a different kind of press pass, so I could go anywhere. So I, you know, I thought, oh, you know, there's such a crowd at the bottom of the boat of the stage, you know. And then I, I, you know, I'm a formerly shy person. I mean, maybe I'm still shy, but you know, I mean, I was really shy. And I just thought, you know, I have to do this. This is, you know, there's no alternative. I'm going to have to use my elbows, get in front of the podium. And so I got there, and then as a good photojournalist, you don't just photograph the celebrity. You look around, do a whole, you know, turn to see what else is going on. And I saw Clinton probably as far as that wall. Of course, I didn't know his name. And people said, did you know he was going to be president someday? <laughs> and then some people say, you know, did you date him? <laughs> no. But, you know, so where was I going with that? Oh, so Shirley Chisholm was at the podium and then she was sitting in the dignitaries area, so I, that's where I photographed her. Was, you know, the one with the pearl necklace was actually with her and her husband. Yeah, so. You take such beautiful, well, yeah, really, really remarkable photos. Thank you. They're all historic. Thank you. I look at them now and I think, damn, I was good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, I mean, they're still, they're kind of, like people say it's an iconic photograph, or I've seen that photograph, and really, so few of them have been published. But somehow I was able to capture what people think of these people. 
so that, you know, there's still a resonance, which is, you know, how did that happen? I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. So, what's the last photo on the back of the brochure? Oh, so that photo was taken at the World Trade Center before, many years before it came down. I think it was the 15th avant-garde art festival that Charlotte Mormon created for New York City. Charlotte Mormon was a great um, musical artist, performance artist. So she would perform, she performed, one of her famous performances was nude on the Staten Island Ferry. She was playing piano and photographed her in a bag, a bag piece at the Museum of Modern Art, where she also bared parts of her body. So it's in her book. <laughs> so, um, she organized avant-garde art festivals, and I went down and photographed it. And this was one of the performance pieces that was happening there. It's what I, one of the things I really miss about New York is street theater and you know performance art. I mean, maybe we see that in Newport, but I don't think <laughs> it's <laughs> I don't think it's created for that purpose. Necessarily. But in New York City, you know the you would see people, you know, performing on the street and shop in store windows. They would, you know, get an empty store window where they could perform. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I miss that expression. Everywhere else I've lived, I've never seen as much. Or any. Yeah. Well, I think you'd see it in London. Yeah, probably in the big cities. That I would think that's great. Thank you very much. I think you all for Shame and scandal in the family. Whoa, is me. Shame and scandal in the family.